Legend goes that in the summer of 1914, a 47-year-old mining millionaire named Stephen Mather visited Yosemite National Park and was disgusted by what he saw. Hiking trails falling into disrepair, paper and bottles littering the paths within the park. Worst of all, there was no department to oversee the parks and fix any of it. Mather wrote to his old college schoolmate, Franklin K. Lane, who was in the Department of the Interior. When Lane received Mather's letter, the tale goes, he replied, Dear Steve, if you don't like the way the national parks are being run, come on down to Washington and run them yourself. In reality, the two men did not even know each other. Mather and Lane had both attended Berkeley, but Lane didn't graduate and they met for the first time much later on. Lane was impressed with Mather's energy and knowledge, and he was aware of his wealth and connections. When Mather was invited to get Congress to form a National Parks Bureau, Lane gave him an assistant, someone to help him navigate the bureaucratic red tape. His name was Horace Albright. Mather took the job on one condition. He would only stay a year. Mather was the idea man, while Albright was the facilitator. And before they can get Congress to approve a National Parks Bureau, they first had to raise public awareness. Congress would never approve money to manage parks that no one was using, and tourists needed roads to get there and trails and facilities once they arrived. In 1915, Mather and Albright toured, inspected, and scrutinized everything, from park entrances to garbage cleanup and the disrepair of major roads. Mather learned that Americans were spending $400 million a year traveling to Europe, so he launched a publicity blitz called See America First. The campaign slogan was plastered on billboards and travel brochures advertising national parks as the playgrounds of the people. Why take a ship across the ocean when you have some of the world's finest natural wonders right in your own backyard? By staying home in America, you are not only getting a bigger bank for your buck, but spending hard-earned cash on American soil. The campaign worked. Americans began hopping on trains in droves, traveling to Yellowstone, Yosemite, and Mount Rainier that August. Nearly a thousand tourists drove their cars through Yellowstone for the first time. With Mather's publicity campaign well underway, it was time to revisit his original mission, convincing Congress to create a National Parks Bureau. Organizing a two-week trip to Sequoia National Park in the Sierra Nevada, inviting several of America's most prominent politicians, businessmen, publishers, and railroad magnates. On the final night, as they sat around a bonfire, Mather made his pitch. Horace Albright recorded Mather's words in his memoir as he created the National Park Service. I think the time has come that I should confess to you why I wanted you to come along with me on this adventure, not only for your interesting company, but in the hopes that you'd see the significance of the mountains in the whole picture of what we're trying to do. Hopefully you will take this message and spread it throughout the land in your avenue and style, that these valleys and heights of the Sierra Nevada are just one small part of the majesty of America. But unless the area is currently held with a separate government agency, we may lose them to selfish interests, and we need to enhance and enlarge our public lands to preserve it for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. Mather's pitch worked. In 1916, President Woodrow Wilson signed the National Park Service Organic Act. The new organization's mission would be to conserve the scenery, natural and historic objects, and the wildlife, and to provide enjoyment in such manner that will conserve the parks for enjoyment of future generations. Mather was named the organization's first director, and Albright would be his number two. They spoke to private businesses to build hotels and restaurants with scenic views. Most significantly was the increase of automobiles. Cars had been changing American roads, allowing Americans to drive right into the parks. By 1918, guests arriving in cars outnumbered those coming by train 7 to 1. 
Eventually, Mather and Albright would use their personal connections to get funds from Congress for a National Parks Highway, which today encompasses a total of 12 parks. The surge of tourists needed managing, so Mather and Albright began working to establish a trained team of park rangers. Applicants had to be between the ages of 21 and 40, of good character, sound physique, and able to deal with people. The requirements included the ability to ride horses, light fires, shoot a gun, and survive in extreme weather conditions. But the parks didn't please everyone. Some complained that the Park Service was a glorified playground commission, and they criticized the director's cheap showmanship. The parks did serve as entertainment for a hungry public, and when there weren't enough bears, the Park Service began constructing small theaters, charging admission to beer feeding shows. Wagons would dump piles of garbage in these arenas at appointed times, and as if on cue, bears would emerge from the woods to feast on the trash all to the delight of park guests. But there were other ecological warning signs. When guests complained about bugs, the Park Service began spraying insecticides. When guests complained that there wasn't enough recreational fishing, the Park Service released non-native trout into the water. In 1921, the Ecological Society of America condemned the practice a similar resolution was passed by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Over time, Mather's management approach changed. He wrote, The first idea of the national parks seems to have been that they were stupendous natural spectacles. Then came the great out-of-doors movement, and people turned to the national parks as places to live. Last came the realization that the parks are not only show places and vacation lands, but also major schoolrooms of Americanism, where people are studying and learning to love more deeply this land in which they live. Mather suffered a paralyzing stroke in 1929, and Albright took over as director. Mountain peaks, valleys, views, and highways would all eventually be named in Mather's honor. Staying on 14 years longer than the one he had promised, Mather oversaw new additions to the National Park Service, like the Grand Canyon and many others. But while Mather pushed for park development, it had many effects on the land. The conflict between wilderness preservation and development for public enjoyment would have grave implications for the wildlife. In 1929, a young naturalist named George Melendez Wright was accompanying a park ranger in a hunt for elk in Yosemite National Park when he noticed that most of the aspen trees in the area have been stripped of their bark. The other parks that he had been studying also had a severe decrease in wolf sightings over the last year. And although they had been seen as a menace, he believed that they were quite necessary. Valleys that were once covered in sagebrush now had all their shrubs and trees stripped clean. Without the predators, the prey have been increasing in number, making it all the better for hunting, but the elk were multiplying too quickly and eating all the greenery, and so by killing so many wolves, they had altered not just the prey, but the landscape as well and not for the better. George Melendez Wright was the son of a wealthy ship captain. His mother was from a prominent dynasty in El Salvador. He earned a degree in zoology before heading to Yosemite. His ability to speak Spanish helped him communicate with the last survivors of the Awanichi tribe and the granddaughter of Chief Tenaya. And what he saw at Yosemite troubled him. Poisonous pesticides were being used to kill pests Wolves were being hunted into extinction, and bears were being fed like pets. 
Wright approached the newly appointed director of the National Park Service, Horace Albright, to undertake a survey of the plants and animals across the national park system, and his study would be a turning point for the parks. Before Europeans set foot in North America, there were an estimated 2 million wolves on the continent. By 1908, their numbers had dropped to 200,000. Wolves were hated creatures. They preyed on ranchers' livestock and had attacked early Western settlers. They were storybook villains. The head of the animal control referred to them as 100% criminal, killing to satisfy its lust than to satisfy a natural and reasonable hunger. In Montana, between 1883 and 1918, over 80,000 wolves were destroyed. The U.S. Forest Service began an initiative to eliminate predators from national forests, and the first on the list was the wolf. What park officials did not understand was the important place the wolves held at the top of the food chain. By removing these apex predators, they were fundamentally altering the entire ecosystem. Ecologists call this phenomenon trophic cascade. At the same time, Yellowstone's leaders encouraged good species by feeding elk, deer, and bison during the winter seasons. Without wolves to kill the deer, their population exploded, leading to overgrazing, loss of vegetation, and soil erosion. In 1930, Wright published the first report of his findings, Fauna of the National Parks of the United States. He concluded that the overpopulation of elk and deer was indeed due to the absence of predators. He urged the National Park Service to stop killing wolves and let nature take its course. Wright was killed in a car accident in 1936 at the age of 31. But scientists who worked with him put out his message. And in 1939, Yellowstone officials ordered that the animals within the park should not be fed and left to fend for themselves and put an end to all beer feeding shows. Unfortunately, weaning bears off human food turned out to be more dangerous than introducing them to it. When the bear feeding areas closed, bears became more aggressive. Meanwhile, the elk population continued to skyrocket. In 1961, rangers held the largest kill ever of 4,309 elk within a couple of weeks. When a television crew captured some of the elk killing, there was a public outcry. And in the aftermath, the Park Service adopted a policy of natural regulation of elk. Instead of artificially controlling the animal population, its numbers would be controlled by limiting factors like winter food availability, severe weather, and natural predators. Public opinion was beginning to shift towards wilderness preservation as scientists, rangers, and policymakers began to recognize the benefit of non-interference in nature. But it would be decades before the park leaders would fully recognize and put into practice the lessons they were learning. And beyond wildlife, there were other features of the parks that they were focused on protecting. Unfortunately, unintended consequences would have them playing with fire. It was a dry day in 1945, and nine men prepared to jump from an airplane. As they jumped out, they saw the smoke that they were aiming for. These men were the California smoke jumpers who did what no one else could. The flames were heading straight for one of the oldest groups of sequoia trees, some of which are thousands of years old, and one of the state's most beloved symbols. The air was filled with smoke, but the technology needed for firefighting on a grand scale had arrived after World War II, like the Scott Air Pack, which allowed firefighters to replace their filtered masks with tanks that provided fresh air. The goal of the smoke jumpers was to hold off the fire 
until the slurry bombers can make it. These were decommissioned military bombers now used to dump water on wildfires. They dump thousands of gallons of water until the area is safe for a little while. The flames were still heading towards the sequoias, but they were slowing, and it seems that these grand old trees will live another day. But how did they survive this long without human help? The official policy of Yellowstone National Park was that the fires needed to be extinguished as soon as they started. The U.S. government did not understand that fires were actually a natural occurrence and served an important function in the forest ecosystem for thousands of years. Fires have been responsible for maintaining vegetation patterns. They also helped ensure diverse selection of vegetation because they cleared out the undergrowth, helping new plants grow and thrive, and above all, the ashes helped nutrients return to the soil for future plants. That was especially significant in places like Sequoia National Park, where natural fire cycles were taking place every five to ten years. These burns help thin out weak and old vegetation, limiting the number of trees to about 50 an acre. They also opened holes in the thick forest canopy, allowing sunlight to reach young sequoia seedlings that would otherwise be blocked out. Without the fires, sequoias had to compete for water and nutrients with other shade-tolerant trees like firs and cedars. Sequoias ballooned up to 3,000 trees per acre, transforming the forest into a giant matchbox, making fires not only more likely, but also a lot hotter. In 1956, park officials were concerned that sequoia saplings did not seem to be growing. Dr. Richard Halverstadt began studying the effects of fire suppression on the giant sequoias in Yosemite and later Sequoia National Park. He had a hunch that the Park Service's fire policy might be the culprit. Halverstadt began experimenting with small-scale prescribed burns, which represented a radical shift in thinking. His research ended up showing something strange. Fire wasn't the evil park officials thought it was. Sequoias could actually withstand fire, and they depended on it to survive. Fires caused their cones to open, releasing their seeds and allowing them to reproduce. Just as fire destroyed, it seemed that it could also give life. In the words of the podcaster Lindsey Graham, host of American History Tellers, the American National Park System holds a unique place on the world stage. No other country has so many places of such beauty so open to the public. Americans can walk into any national park in the country and proudly say to themselves that they own a piece of these remarkable places. Writer and environmentalist Wallace Stegner calls them the best idea we've ever had. Absolutely American, absolutely democratic, they reflect us at our best rather than our worst. But since their creation, the national parks have been like the countries they represent. An experiment. We'd made mistakes many of them disastrous. People were slaughtered, animals were hunted to near extinction, valleys were flooded, and private interests battled and sometimes defeated the public good. The fight to balance preservation and conservation still continues today. As our country has grown and changed, so have our parks. What started out as an idea to protect land and animals has grown into a desire to teach others about their world their country, and themselves. So there you have it, the story how our national parks taught us about some fundamental concepts of ecology. If you learned something you didn't know, be sure to leave a comment as to what that was and what you'd like to see next. <laughs>